Um, hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, my name is Jenny, and I'm one of the MA students here uh, in the conservation program at UCLA. Um, before, we be, uh, before we get started, I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. Um, I know that we're all very scattered, as we can already see from the chat, but since our program is based here in um, LA, we would like to respectfully acknowledge the Gabrielina Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tovang R, currently known as the Los Angeles Basin and Southern Channel Islands. As a land-grant institution, we pay our respects to the Hanukvatam, our ancestors, Ahihirum elders, and Iohin Kem, um, our relatives past, present, and emerging. Please feel free to add your own acknowledgments in the chat if you wish. Um, so with that, I am excited to welcome you to this week's conservation conversation. Um, this is probably no longer news to many of you here, but once a month on Fridays, we invite new guests um, engaged in exciting research uh, and in talking about interesting topics in the conservation field to come and speak with us. Um, this week, we have the pleasure of hosting artist Andrea Geyer, who will be interviewed by Professor Glenn Wharton on her work, Nine Scripts for a Nation at War. Um, Andrea Geyer is a multidisciplinary artist unsensing the construction and politics of time. Her works use performance and video to activate the lingering potential of specific events, places, or biographies as lived in women, women and sorry, women identified bodies. She materializes the entanglement of presence and absence of such bodies due to ideologically motivated omissions in archives and memories. Her work has been exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art, the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, IMMA in Dublin, Tate Modern in London, Generali Foundation, Secession in Vienna, Whit de White in Rotterdam, Sao Paulo Biennale and Document 12 Castle. She is represented by Hales Gallery in London and New York, Gallery Thomas Sanger in Cologne, and she lives and works in New York. Um, Glenn Wharton is a professor of art history and professor in the and a professor of the conservation of material culture, as well as chair of the UCLA Getty program in the conservation of archaeological and ethnographic materials. Professor Wharton most recently taught at New York University as clinical professor in museum studies, in addition to his academic positions. Wharton is also an experienced art conservator with an extensive background in archaeological, sculpture, and time-based media conservation, who has worked and consulted at such museums as the Museum of Modern Art in New York and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Wharton received his PhD in conservation and archaeology from the Institute of Archaeology, University College London in 2005. He has received, amongst others, a digital pedagogy grant from New York University in 2018, a Getty Conservation Institute Guest Scholar Fellowship in 2017, a College Art Association Heritage Heritage Preservation Award for Distinction in Scholarship and Conservation in 2015, and the Historic Hawaii Foundation Preservation Media Award for the Painted King Art Activism and Authenticity in Hawaii in, 20 and 12, in 2012. His research areas of interest include archaeological conservation, illicit trade, cultural heritage management, contemporary art conservation with specialization in time-based media, and addressing social justice, inclusion, and climate change um, in conservation specifically. Now, without further ado, please welcome our speakers with a round of applause, and I will hand it over to Glenn um, to introduce what we are chatting about today. Great. Thank you, Jenny. Um, I'll give a short introduction, and then I'll turn it over to Andrea to present Nine Scripts for a Nation at War, the work that we'll be discussing today. And after her presentation, we'll return to a conversation, then we'll open it up for questions towards the end. So I'm very pleased to share this event with Andrea Geyer, not only because of her brilliant blend of creativity and activism and use of technology in her art, but because she's a dear friend. And Andrea, if you'll forgive me, I'd like to share um, how our friendship began, if only because I think it's a great story. Um, but first, I'll tell you a little bit about my work as the time-based media conservator at MoMA. In addition to performing conservation interventions, a large part of what I did was to build institutional capacity about the media and performance works in the collection to allow future conservators, curators, installers, and others to make decisions about displaying and conserving the works. Time-based media conservators create thick documentation that includes images, floor plans, installation manuals with technical specifications, 
videos, artist questionnaires, and artist interviews. This documentation is important because many of the works are intended to be variable. And by this, I mean that the artists transfer a certain amount of interpretive authority to the museum to decide how to display the work. Defining the parameters of this interpretation is central to time-based media conservation. We characterize the work defining properties that are essential to retain during future interpretation and conservation intervention. So authenticity for many of these works doesn't lie in the material manifestation of the work. Sometimes it's the idea or action or call to action that needs to be preserved. And of course, video, audio, and software works depend on commercial technologies that become obsolescent over time. Even if we wanted to purchase the same replacement projectors, monitors, and playback equipment, we wouldn't be able to do so. So even for works where the artists want them to be fixed, they have to change to some extent through technical migration to new technologies in order to survive. We strive to document the artist's vision for how the public should experience their work along with allowable changes over time. So when the museum acquired complex media works and all performance works, I would set up a conservation interview with the artists. Nine Scripts for a Nation at War was one such work as we'll learn when Andrea describes it. When I let the curator know that I wanted to interview at least one of the artists who produced it, I was told that Andrea Geyer was already spending a lot of time at Moma's Conservation Lab. I said, oh, is she the artist who has a fellowship to produce a series of images of uh, Moma's Conservation Lab? And I said, and I was told, yes, that's right. So the next time I saw Andrea in the lab, I identified myself, told her that I would like to set up a conservation interview and we immediately fell into a long conversation that started with her describing the work to me. And then we moved over to broader issues of politics and life. And by the end, she told me that her wife was pregnant with twin boys. And I told her that my husband and I also had twin sons. So soon after this conversation, our lives became even more entangled. Several weeks later, by chance, I met a very pregnant woman, Jane Anderson, at an NYU event who said she was carrying twin boys. Not only was she Andrea's wife, but she was soon hired as a professor in the Museum Studies Program in the Anthropology Department at NYU. So we became colleagues in the Museum Studies Program with offices next to each other. So over time, we all became friends. The four boys have all met each other. And now I get to watch a new set of twins growing up in New York City. So um, with that somewhat unusual introduction, I'll turn it over to Andrea, who will now describe the work. Um, thank you so much, Glenn, for this charming uh, introduction. And of course, I do have to acknowledge that you know, you guys were, were trailblazers for queer parenting. And uh, so we are very indebted, not just for the diapering tips, but for the way of making, you know, this more um, a possibility and a vision and something for us to look towards um, as queer parents. And I learned a lot over the last eight years of that project. So let me um, share my screen. Of course, the project, um, the, the proposal of, um, presenting this work within 10 minutes is absolutely impossible. So I, and then I also had some desires of um, sharing a work with you that like sharing different aspects of the work with you um, that might be interesting from the perspective of conservation. So I feel like it might be more scrambled than a usual presentation would be about the work, um, but I, let's give it a go and let's try. So, um, I also um, would like to uh, begin uh, this presentation by acknowledging, um, let me see one thing is happening here, it's not supposed to happening, um, that, I, that we are acknowledging that I speak from the unceded territory of the Lenape people, and I would like, like to acknowledge and pay my respect to the Lenape ancestors to present and future generations on this homeland, as well as throughout the Lenape diaspora. 
I would also like to extend this acknowledgement to all indigenous people who now and in the future call these Lenape homeland, Lenape Hawking and home. This acknowledgement is uh, my commitment to the process of addressing the ongoing legacies of colon settler colonialism and actively work um, to disable these. So Nine Scripts from a Nation at War um, is a collaboration uh, with four of my closest friends, uh, Sharon Hayes, Ashley Hunt, Katya Sander, and David Thorne. Um, the piece was created uh, in response to an invitation to create a work uh, for Documenta 12 in 2007. About eight years prior to this collaboration, the five of us in various configurations had collaborated on the production of works, the organization of symposia, writing projects, online forums, activism, and ongoing discussions around one another's individual projects. But we did not exist as a collaborative group before this project and did not um, exist as such after this project. Uh, the invitation to propose a project to Documenta 12 was interesting to us because it gave us an opportunity to formalize certain of these existing ways of being colleagues to each other, to see what we could learn and where we could move within the time and support to actually dig more deeply into some of our shared artistic, intellectual and political territory that existed already between our separate interests. We began working together in August of 2004, which was also one year into the US invasion into Iraq, an event in a condition that occupied many of our discussions and came to be the central focus of the work. The work consists of nine hours of video. So there's absolutely, I won't even try to share that with you. Also because uh, Zoom is, a, as all of us probably know, a terrible format to share videos. So I threw a, a short two minute clip in here and um, Jenny, who I also wanted to thank Jenny, Deidre and Ellen to host me today. Sorry that I forgot that, but um, it will throw this into the chat so that you could also, if the video is choppy, you can just click on the Vimeo link and watch it in your own browser. So let's just give us a little bit of a, of a taste, a two minute taste of the works um, content. Um, so the whole um, 
four minutes of each of the 10 videos is accessible on this website. This is why I threw this in there. If you Google for the name of the um, title of the work, you will also find that. Um, but this, what you just watched, is an excerpt of um, one of the videos titled Citizen, which um, has over an hour runtime and is just a procession of people writing and erasing and writing and erasing um, statements for what I will do when I become a citizen. Um, I dug around for this presentation. I apologize, the kind of text text heavy slide, but um, because I, I looked for the original proposal for the uh, project, which I thought was interesting as a kind of breath. So um, this is a, the proposal that we wrote in 2005, um, kind of indicating who we are, uh, what we're interested in doing, and um, the kind of five questions that were driving our um, our uh, work together, which is um, we we said we have these five uh, these five questions to start the work in a general way. Each question marks a particular instance of inscription, a dilemma interested in addressing. Why is it so difficult to refuse? What does one do after being named the enemy? Where does social discontent go when it dies? What's God got to do with it? And how do I stop repeating myself, or do I really want to? So one of the central issues that we were interested in looking at, thinking about and responding to in this work and an issue that provided something of an initial common ground when we began working is, what are some of the ways in which one can speak about an experience of the conditions of war from a distance and yet never far from it? How one narrates reports and responds. Questions about speaking are the consistent focus, are the consistent focus across all the materials in this piece. And in some ways, Particularly in these, in in some of in one of the um, no, sorry, that was like I shouldn't put this in here. Um, so this question about speaking, our consistent focus in all of the materials of of the pieces. How do we speak? Who do we address? So um, when there is, for example, um, let me just go to this next slide. So here are the um, the nine the nine figures that we addressed. Citizens, blogger, correspondent, veteran, student, actor, interviewer, lawyer, and detainee. And then there is this video called The Source, which is basically a process of transcribing, which shows how we work. Because one of the things that we were doing often were creating interviews, we were transcribing these interviews and then um, creating scripts from it. What was interesting for us, because this was pre-Zoom and pre-remote learning, is that we um, the way, way we developed these uh, works from these five, five initial questions that I shared with you was that we basically um, tried to meet. We had these kind of workshops that would produce um, these kind of diagrams where we were trying to figure out what are some of these questions, what are some of the figures, what are some of the roles that we are interested in that this condition of being at war um, with Iraq uh, would produce for us living in the US. We had uh, two artists living at the West Coast, two artists living in New York, and one artist living in, in uh, Copenhagen, Denmark. It was important for us to have a kind of outside perspective. So we would have these meetings, get to these diagrams, and then we would take a figure individually or often as teams, most, most often as teams of two, two of us, kind of work of that work with them and then bring them back into the group and then have conversations. And I I thought it was interesting to share this because one of the formats that we started having conversations were these group chats, which already existed on the phone that you could do like pre other forms of message. We're, two, we're in 2004. So this is some of these kind of, um, I thought really interesting ways in which we try to generate text. So to not just speak to each other on the phone, but already in our process, this idea of voice, of writing, of speech was part of it. And some of you might know people in this group and it's very, um, the humor is all across it. We had a very kind of fluid um, relationship, but we literally discussed anything from formats to, to ways of filming, ways of finding individuals to engage with. It was a truly 100% collaborative project, which um, resulted in the kind of working conditions that everything took. I always say like collaborating with five people me means that everything takes five times as long. And that's um, not actually a problem. It was cumbersome and we all um, decided we'll never work together <laughs> again, but it produced something that none of us could do on their own, which is a kind of staying present to this kind of multitude 
of, of ways of thinking about it, of ways of engaging it through some of the pictures that we shared with each other. We had a blog where we just throw things into that we find um, to kind of create a common ground of what marketing, demarcating of what are the things that, but that we are interested in. So let me see if I can find the note in my... Um... So, so the thing that we, and you can see this already in this diagram that I'm sharing, like one of the things we developed early were, was this idea and the notion of the figure. Um, and the, the figures in the piece are, and I'm gonna go back to this slide, um, the citizen, a blogger, a correspondent, a soldier, a lawyer, a student, a source, an interviewer, an actor, and a detainee. Those are the nine figures that we were um, working with. These figures are not meant to be definitely, definite roles at play in the condition of war, but rather these specific figures interact in certain relationships that we were interested in, and the questions the piece attempts to ask about speech and war. What is significant for us in terms of these figures that there are positions or roles that are singularly embodied. Here, I mean that singular as opposed to the universal and also a singular as distinct from some notion of the particular or the relative, like in the sense how you can you know, pick a, a soldier and make the story about the soldier. So we were interested in something that is neither kind of exemplatory nor is it um, kind of unique to the figure, but something that is a little it's unique to a person, but it's a little bit wider, which is the figure. So when we were interviewing uh, the soldiers, um, so what was significant for us um, was that when we were interviewing um, a soldier, um, that the soldier was not Micaela Montonia, who was one of the work people we worked with, or Omar Portilla, uh, as a traditional documentary would do, but we were interviewing them, really trying to understand what their individual and singular experience kind of um, produced for them being under the conditions of war. Um, so we interviewed, interviewed each of them about their lives, but uh, per se, but also specifically of how they moved from individuals, being individuals in their lives into the role of a soldier. We asked them about the routines that they were engaged in as soldiers and also some particulars about their time in Iraq. We also asked them about their process on the other side, moving out of the position of soldier and back into the position of being an individual. Then we edited the transcripts of their interviews into a speech that we asked them to perform themselves. So uh, we met with them multiple times in their homes and interviewed them. We edited the speech and then we met again in a green room where we, um, in a theater, in an auditorium at the new school where we were shooting most of this, this work. And um, we asked them to read the text for the first time, the speech, which is basically their own words back to them. And we filmed them doing that. So it was really um, interesting for us because both of them were, were talking to us very, very uh, specifically afterwards about that what they were going through with us was a process of creating a memory through language um, to experiences that they hadn't really ever put in words before. So we were really interested also in this, the notion of the script and that the script um, is in on one hand a transcript from interviews, but then becomes a script to be performed to do something else. So it's kind of interesting how the idea of script kind of points both backwards and forward in time. And in each of these figures, we argue something else happens in relationship to a transcript and then a script that is being performed. I cannot go sadly through all of this, but um, just for an, another example, in the case of the lawyer, our initial interview with the lawyer representing Yemeni detainees in Guantanamo was turned into a script for an actor to perform. Here, the two pieces of footage that are shown as the double screen, um, are the rehearsal footage and then the actual performance footage that we put together. Um, in both cases, the soldier and the lawyer, we were interested in po uh, posit positing the space of self-representation as one that is layered and complicated by various intersections of writing oneself and being written from the outside, right? So we, we are trying to write ourselves into existence, but we're also continuously inscribed from the outside. Um, Already the title of our piece, Nine Scripts from a Nation at War, places the notion of a script central, quite simply suggesting that our piece consists of, out of a number of script, 
but it is less clear what constitutes a script or what level we're talking about a script. Is it a situation for viewing, a kind of organization of viewers, or is it a screen or a video? Is it that which you see happening on the screen, or is it the text that they're speaking and producing, or is it the very staging of it? For us, this more ambiguous idea of scripts and scripting has been important, not only as a notion of the title, but also very much as the axis for our continued discussion of method, as a way of understanding our way of working, both working between us, sending emails and images and back and forth, as well as working through the field of interest laid out in front of us. Central to this more method-related discussion has been the notion scripts and scripting as a relation between speech and text, speaking and writing, both as actions themselves, as well as it points to text and speech as framing or conditioning of actions. So scripts and scripting could be understood as having multiple capacities, pointing both to the past and the future, as a past in terms of understanding it as a transcription or des description, and as a document of something that has happened, and to the future as a set of instructions, a structure that will be prescribed, instructed, provided as a frame to act within or to take actions from. And I'm kind of labor on that a little bit because I thought it was interesting talking about conservation and um, the directives that we do. So um, this was the original installation for the work, which um, we worked with an architect named Nana Wülfing who um, developed viewing stations for us. One thing that was really important for us was that this nine hour of footage, um, it wasn't something that anybody would sit through. We also didn't want to prescribe how exactly it was viewed, which order you viewed, like we didn't want it to be linear. We wanted people to self self organize themselves around I'm watching this for this long I'm watching that for that long It was very important to us that people curated their own interactions with the work itself. And um, we we did a lot of research in what that could look like, and we landed on things like library library desks and archive carols that you could sit in that would um, kind of propose agency in the viewer themselves. And um, the big challenge we had for this very difficult, very light room that was also very busy was that we needed to create a structure for viewers to be able to zoom in and to be really present in terms of uh, for the content that was delivered. So we created these like, um, they were like Atari PlayStation, like kind of these carols that you said, and you can see it that the, a little bit in one of the slides that it got, it went deep into, so you could see the screens really well. Um, and you could kind of zone in, in this very noisy environment and focus. And it was really wonderful to see how many people spent hours in this, um, environment to to look at the work and we also because it was so busy we had the descriptions and the titles of each video that they were watching silk screened onto the desks when we then uh, were invited to rethink this piece for the tate modern um a year later we uh, had a darkened space that was uh, much easier to um uh, the, the videos didn't have to be hidden in the same way or kind of kind of sunk into architecture, into furniture, sorry. So we um, kind of rethought with Nana the um, design of these um, of these viewing stations. And we developed this uh, form of the of the piece, which um, uh, is now the kind of standard version of the work when it is shown. Another really important aspect for us, in this uh, way of thinking about installation was that it was important for us that the work always would feel like it would just temporarily occupying, um, occupying the space. So we didn't want it to be part of the architecture. We didn't want to project onto the wall. We wanted to, to have kind of um, structures that, would, that you could fold up and take with you, a screen that pulls up that's not always there, something that, that would just travel and kind of occupy the space temporarily. So we had that kind of desire of it being um, perceived in this way. And also um, one of the things that we always struggle with museums to make happen is that that this work is when it's shown is always shown before the paywall so that people do not have to pay 
uh, seeing the, the work because it takes a long time to view it and we didn't want um, things to be cost prohibitive. And I, Glenn, I probably didn't, doesn't know about this, but it was quite a struggle to make that happen at MoMA, but we, we managed. Um, even though it probably didn't reach everybody we wanted to reach, but um, some people could go back and over and over without um, paying to see the work. Um, this is uh, the installation at Red Cat in, in um, LA. When we install the work, we all um, meet together, we talk about it, we agree um, to accept or not accept an invitation. And then usually one or two people, usually two of us take over to then be the kind of point person to install the work. Um, if there are any major questions of change, we, we discuss it, but we basically, the work now exists in this form that then can travel, that we share the responsibility for it. Um, and then last but not least, um, the work was installed, installed at MoMA in it's wrong date. It was in 2012. Um, see, I didn't, sorry, I didn't fix that. But so it was in 2012 at MoMA, uh, which also then acquired the work, which was really important for us because one of the things that was um, is worrisome is when you have your own artist studio, it's like, how do you conserve and preserve video um, in a very rigorous way? I mean, we all have copies of the piece. Uh, we do migrate the material, but it, it is makes me sleep um, sleep more soundly knowing that there's also an institution maintaining the kind of uh, video and data so that it doesn't get uh, lost because it's a lot of materials that happen in that. Um, just looking at the time. Um, so one of the things um, that, that was because um, Glenn asked me to talk about some of the challenges that we faced, and I think around collaboration, and I do want to name this because this is from the original proposal um, that we sent to, to Castle, um, was that we do not collapse our practices into one. We were really kind of, um, we were really insisting on this, this is a collaboration across five people, which is a little unusual in the art world, in the sense that usually then this would turn into a group name a group identity, a kind of new unit. And we really resisted that because we felt that it would not truly speak to the authorship of the piece itself if we would collapse our name into a group name because anybody who knows, a few of us knows that we're all pretty high, strong, like determined, rigorous, detail, um, oriented artists who have very unique voices and we all collaborate with other people. But I think it was really important for us to to um, that we were organizing across difference and that we had to really felt strongly that that difference had to be maintained over the course of this um, of this project because a project like the one we started to do or attempted to do was utterly impossible to do as an individual and to insist in this kind of notion of collectivity. I mean, I could talk about a whole other other things around how, like in in a, in the databases. I mean, some of you might know this. You know, like in databases in collection, you can't put more than one artist, or you can't, or there's all these languages that will prioritize one artist over another, and so on and so on. So this insistence of like being a, a group that's organized across difference and maintains the difference throughout the work, and that that's what made that work what it is is something that we constantly were struggling with. At Documenta, I mean, they were like, it was really, they were really pushing us to make a, to give us a group name to how do we fit into the catalog? Where are we listed? Which name is first? And so on and so on. It was quite a, a, a struggle. And they, they did at the end um, do this, they, they they made us do the parentheses around it. Like they couldn't just have the names there. We in the catalog, we we fought really hard just to have the names listed. You think it's a simple thing. And it was actually very interesting for me how much resist I learned a lot about institutional um kind of framing of art and art practice and this deep dedication to a sole author, a sole person who kind of drives a work and and the struggle. Um, art history and institutions have to let go of that in the cases where that doesn't make any sense. Um, I'm going to try to wrap up. I wanted to share, because Glenn asked me to share this with you. One thing we did is a very comprehensive installation manual so that we share with people that um, 
is a lot of work to put together, but I must say it's really a lifesaver with um, moving like when the work is shown. So it gives you all the kind of content of the work, content information, but it gives you also technical things. So um, you can see this is the content. It's 51 pages. I will not go through all of this, but it has all the kind of aspects that you need when you install the work. Uh, descriptive text, then a kind of description of each of the of the works. You you see here. This is uh, the first one. Two hundred forty eight predictions of what I will do when democracy comes, with all the credits of the performers, everything that needed to be there. Um, so that that um, whoever was showing the work had all this information um, together in in one place. Um, Part of these installation requirements are hardware. It's a very tech heavy, um, heavy piece uh, that we can talk, Glenn and I can talk about because I know he has all these questions about it. I'm like, I don't know. But um, it's been really great to think about what are the parameters of what needs to be, um, what not needs to be maintained, what doesn't need to be maintained, what are the important markers of the piece. And then, um, yeah, this is more, you know, you see lots of lots of materials, and then also the the benches, the furniture that needs to be built. It's usually not suitable for institutions to store work like that. We have one set that's like basically just um, in a barn of a friend of mine in Germany, but it makes no sense to keep that stuff because at the end of the day, people want to remake it anyway. Um, so all of this, and then um, there's another installation requirement. Um, according labor, so that we are really kind of marking out all of this, the steps that a museum needs to consider um, what, if they want to show this work and to get really bring it down that it's like it's a tech heavy piece, you need really to be ready to, to care for it if you want to show the work. Um, then group exhibitions, the installation views we just looked at, biographies, um, thank yous, a bibliography, and then architectural drawings by Nana Wulfing for the for the um, installation things. And then uh, I guess this is a doubling of what I just had. All right, and then the press package. I think I'll stop here. Um, I hope this gave you all a little bit of a sense. See if it lets me stop. Yes, uh, an entry into the work. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Andrea. That was um, really just a great introduction um, to the work. We don't have too much time. Um, I, I think we should just have a little conversation, then we can open it up to questions from the audience as well. I see there's quite a few time-based media conservators have joined, including the chief um, conservator at MoMA. So um, we might hear from some of these people as well. Um, so we're not actually modeling an artist interview here, even though I started you know, the presentation by describing the interviews that we did at MoMA and the one that, that we did with you, which is now archived at MoMA. But I will say a couple of things um, just to get, get us going. Um, what I usually do in these interviews is start by asking the artist about the production of the work and then moving into sort of the technology um, and then you know how it was made and then how, what are we receiving as a museum and then moving to sort of the future installations of the work and what are these the essential characteristics of the work that should be conserved in order to um, retain what it is even though materially and technically it will change over time so that that's normally the pattern of, of my interviews um, and I'll, I'll sort of do that now, but um, I do want to say, first of all, you mentioned the collections management database, and that was always such a problem for us at MoMA because these works are variable, sometimes multi-authored like your work. And yes, the, the, the databases are structured for standard works that just have one object, one artist, and a, a set of materials that can be described. So this it was always really a challenge uh, with these hierarchical databases to allow for multiple entries of, of parallel information. But um, let's just go back to creating the work. I think the, the most 
challenging thing, or one of the most challenging things for us at, at the museum was to just get our hands around this collaboration of artists. Um, and, you know, from a very pragmatic point of view, I wanted to know, well, who do we call if we want to know something? There's, there's five of you. Do we need to get you all on a group call? Or is there a lead artist? Or um, is there going to be someone designated? But this also sort of gets me thinking about how you collaborated and how you did sort of take leadership amongst yourselves. And you want to talk a little bit more about the collaboration and then how, how you think the museum should approach the artists when questions come up? Well, this is the thing we, as I, as I mentioned, you know, this like being full collaborators on this, we all can do everything that needs to be done in the work, in this work. So all of us have, have, can do videos, can edit, uh, can script, can direct, uh, can do all the details that are part of this. And this is, uh, so we all shot the pieces together. I mean, sometimes it was teams of like taking care of the technical shooting, but the research it was this constant, like if we took something out, we would have these discussion meetings around that diagram. And then we would decide, assign who will work on which figure. Then we would team up and two of us would work on the figure, produce material, and then throw it back into the bucket, right? So it's fully, there is no lead artist in this piece at all. It's really a full collaboration. And this is why we insisted on all of this. So, but it also means that you as a museum can call any of us, you know, and then you can call any of us and you can, you will get slightly varying um, responses, but that's okay because we maintain that we maintain that difference throughout the piece, right? So there's still a video in this in these 10 videos that I don't want to be there, you know, but I have learned about the many ways of that I really have strong feelings that it's not strong enough, it shouldn't be there, because of course there was a massive process of editing. We worked on this piece for over three years. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a lot of things that were cut out. And, you know, like, but my colleagues, some of my colleagues strongly feel that that video needs to be part of this group of videos. Um, and, you know, I always struggle with it, but I have learned that I am wrong, you know, by showing the piece and having conversations with audiences, I still have the same feelings. And if this would be my work, this one video would not be in it. But because it's a, it's a commitment to trusting each other's choices, right? We, we really early on said we were not going to do, we're not going to go to this place where we all agree on everything. Because then things get rounded up so much that what makes our different position interesting gets lost. So it was a real commitment to the kind of, that's why it took so long to make it. Um, but this is why um, there, there is this insistence or why, you know, some of the texts I wrote, this is collectively written, you know, like we have made presentations, we share presentations with each other. It's like we don't police each other around the work at all but we because we all are dedicated to this this thing that I am voicing which that this is a fully five authored work um so the museum can call anybody to find out what they need do we have of course different specialties that we can um but we will then reach out to each other if it's like something hyper technical you know that we all have slightly better expertises as the other um, but we, that's how it works. It's like, we, we just trust each other still, because one of the big things was when we started collaborating for this very high profile exhibition was that we said that we will, we commit to remaining friends throughout this process. Uh, we will rather, we will rather stop the process than our friendships. And it wasn't easy. I can tell you, it was not easy. It was very difficult, but it we really stick to that. So this is why even to this day, we have this um, collaborative conversation about this. Remember, um, we could go on and on about, about, about this collaboration, but in mm -hmm. the interest of time, we should probably just move to another point. But I do remember being very worried <laughs> at MoMA, uh-oh, there's all these artists and they had different opinions when they were creating the work and we're expected to just call one of them and, you know, trust that the others will be okay with whatever the one, well, the one recommends. But anyway, we could go on about that, but it, I just remember that was a real 
concern for me, and I just wanted to get that right or understand what you all felt, you know, for the museum's archives for the future. Um, let's talk about another aspect of the work, which I think is interesting. Um, so you showed several installations of the work, and each time it was different, different furniture, different room. And you mentioned when you were describing it that it sort of, um, a standard way of exhibiting it um, developed. And you know, I've interviewed a lot of artists now and, and I've heard this over and over again that early on in the installations, artists like to try this way, this way, and then they, they kind of develop a, a, a standard way of exhibiting it and it kind of settles in. And sometimes it just then becomes fixed. This is the furniture, this is the way it should always be installed. What are your thoughts about future variability? Do you think it's fixed now and it should always be installed exactly the same way or can the furniture change? Well, there's a lot of parameters that could change with the work like this. Um, I, I remember you were asking us about our, our flexibility in terms of what kind of surface, you know, this happens on. And um, I think both Sharon and I, who were in that conversation, were like, I don't know, Glenn, we have no idea because it's so we don't know what the technology will look like in the future, right? You can know that when it, when it is there. I think that um, the idea that the ideas of it being something that occupies a museum rather than becoming part of the institution that's kind of moved in and moved out to have that feel of it. So that's important. I think the the architecture, the furniture, we spent a lot of time really developing it. I mean, at Documenta, the, the conditions were impossible and we made it possible to view video in that environment. But um, so maybe that should be, that was not really how we would have chosen to show it, even though it ended up being a great place for the work. Um, but this idea of these kind of lightweight carols that people can sit and there's rules that you can, there's clusters of work we like together um, in vicinity to each other, but it doesn't, even that has been, there's variation in it. But what's important for us is that when you look up that you see other people viewing, that's important, for example, right? So that it's not like a row of them. Uh, against the wall, but that there is a kind of communal experience that you understand that you're watching this, not, this is not an alone thing. It's not singular to yourself, but it's a collective viewing environment, or there's the possibility of, it's, it's inviting to come back. It, and also it's, it's not like a, 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 something where you just sit back, but you have a, most of them have a, this little desk structure where you sit at it, this idea of study is something that that the installation needs to maintain as a feel. So there's more these kind of um, methods of viewing or ideas of viewing that I think um, are very fixed and very settled in and not variable. But then I think, and I feel like, believe me, we tried so many different ways of building these tables. We went through a long design process with Nana. And um, I do think this is a really nice uh, form for it. And I don't, we don't, I don't see a reason to change it. I don't think any of us see a reason to change it, given how much care we put into designing these viewing stations. Um, yeah. Um, okay, thanks. And, you know, I mentioned at the beginning of, of uh, the session, the, one of the things that the conservator tries to do is understand the essential characteristics of a work mm -hmm. um, in order to have it be shown appropriately in the future. And so you've mentioned a couple of things today that one wouldn't necessarily think about. Uh, for instance, you just said that the viewer should experience it as a communal, in a communal situation. Like I wouldn't necessarily know that, but since you said it, that can be communicated to future staff at the museum. You also mentioned that it should be shown um, before the paywall mm -hmm. uh, at the museum. Mm -hmm. for I'm sure many political, but also logistical reasons. So these are the kinds of things that the conservator wants to capture and you know to preserve, even though those are really intangible aspects of, of the work. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to move, I just gonna ask you one more kind of short question, because I'd also like to open it up to the audience um, about the wall label. Mm -hmm. And again, this isn't something that I would have necessarily thought of, but I remember there was quite a bit of discussion about what should be on the wall label. 
um, including the artists, the order of the artists, but, but other people involved in the production. Do you want to discuss that a little bit? Yeah, I think it was one of the things that was very important for us was to name everybody who was involved in the piece and um, to have them. I mean, they're not collaborators, they're actors and they're people we, we um, you know, engaged with the sources. And um, but I think for us, it was important to mark that these things don't get produced out of vacuums and that everybody who was involved in it is a kind of important agent. Um, we hired an editor because that is the thing where we knew our collaboration would die if we would start editing this footage ourselves. We were enough video artists, each of us, to know, to not be naive about what happens when we edit our own work. So we edited, we hired uh, another person to edit it, Frederick Moffat, who was amazing, who had a lot of input. So there is, I think it's important there are other genre, other ways, um, other areas like theater or film where people are just named. And I think it's a real bad habit in art that neither the bibliographies nor the, the people who are part of making are named. And I think this idea of that, the insistence that topics like the one this work addresses are just not suitable for a single mind. And also in the making are not suitable for even a few people, but it takes more than, a it takes a group and it takes all these different expertises and sensibilities to make sense of something. And um, so I think that, that we wanted to acknowledge that. And then language, I think there is, um, we are all, we all write, we, we are all very, very specific around word choice. Um, it's very important to us how things are named um, because the whole work is about that, right? The whole work is about what language does, can do, should do, doesn't do. And so the wall text um, was quite a collaborative challenge um, between also what the institution does in terms of assuming a certain language that is suitable for, for their viewers. So we also uh, refused some of this... Um, kind of explanatory or simplifying um, attempt that the wall text was trying to do in its original form, where it tried to just kind of umbrella something in a, in a more simple way. And it's just from my experience, I mean, of course, museums have a lot of experience and, and know their audiences very, very well. But one of my, my struggle as an artist is always that I feel there's a there's an assumption of simplification that I have never, have very, very rarely seen an audience member needing. You know, like it's- yeah. So I, it's, I remember yeah. thinking um, at the time that this, it, it became so complex. And, and again, I think this is another intangible, essential aspect of the work. What's on the wall label and, and, and how the work is described. And, you know, you, you've described the importance of the collective action mm -hmm. or the collective creation of the work and that that be conveyed in the exhibition as well through the wall label. Um, so one thing, I think we, if I, I may, you know, one thing, just, okay. yeah, just, I just want to add one thing because I think it's important that in this, one thing that a collaboration with five artists who are really equal to you allow is that certain things that we all cared about, we could actually maintain through this whole process because we were not just an artist you know, in dialogue with the institution. There, we were a little institution ourselves and we, were, we had very strong values and, and um, uh, parameters under which we wanted to, to realize the work and the language around it was, was um, important. So I know as an artist, if I do that on my own, often just this back and forth, there's a certain moment where you're like, oh my God, they hate me. And I cannot send this back one more time, you know, because they're going to think I'm like a horrible person and you don't want to lose, you know, um, pay, you don't want to totally mess it up with the people you're working with who are most often good people, right? Um, well, on that note, why don't we open it up for let's questions? Open it up. We exactly. only have like a couple of minutes oh, left. Oh, a couple of minutes, so, three o'clock. Um, yeah. <laughs>